It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 35. This is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Carl Hammer, the founder and president of Vermont Compost Company. Vermont Compost collects food waste and manure in central Vermont and adds it to grass, tree bark, and chickens on the farm to create a compost that serves as the basis for potting soils that have created raving fans all over the United States. Carl is a font of knowledge about all things soil, plant, and long-eared equine, and we tap into just a corner of that here with the history of Vermont Compost Company, from Carl's start as a young boy shoveling manure in Versha, Vermont, to its modern-day national distribution, with plenty of detours into soil, society, and the potential for great compost to catalyze the recapture of carbon on farmland. I am super grateful for Carl's support of the Farmer to Farmer podcast since very early in the broadcast. It's typical of Carl that they would be out in front in supporting cool things that are happening on farms and for farmers. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Audible. Discover the world of audiobooks and absorb yourself in the latest business management texts, farming essays, or all three volumes of The Lord of the Rings. Get your free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer. Carl Hammer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'd like to just get a layout for Vermont Compost Company. There's there's so many things going on. I mean, I think about compost companies and you got pictures of stock photos of of uh, of compost operations and it's it's long windrows on concrete or or bare dirt of cow manure and and straw. And that's not you and it's not in fact even the compost isn't really the end product that Vermont Compost is primarily producing. So can you kind of give us the lay of the land there at Vermont Compost as to how it all fits together? I mean, well, um, and, and we do, we do use windrows, um, um, windrows on soil under the sky is, um, uh, uh, an early idea we had, um, uh, and coupled with the notion that the project should increase the farmability of the host land. But Vermont Compost, uh, well, I, I started as a, uh, how far back do I go? When I was about eight years old, my parents saved a thousand bucks and drove north with it from the island of Manhattan. And they drove north till they could buy more than a hundred acres with their thousand dollars. And that landed them in a town called Versher, Vermont at the very top of the watershed. And they bought, as it turned out, 125 acres for $1,250. I had to go back and borrow $250 from my father's father, who kissed it goodbye very dramatically. I was there when he (laughs) peeled off the money and he gave it a little kiss and sent it because he said, Vermont, where where is that? It took... Those days, it took nine (laughs) hours, nine hours to get there. You know, the interstates had... This was 1960. So anyway... And there we were on top of this hill and surrounded by the last redoubt of European peasant farming in, you know, Vermont. I mean, six and eight cow farms, uh, the farmer at the end grabbing, the, coming down the hill in, in the morning and picking up the milk cans and taking them to the creamery and returning to, to his farm, um, distributing sterilized empty cans just before the bulk tank rules came. And... Uh, coming from a basement apartment on the west side of Manhattan and sort of seeing this incredible universe of people who drilled holes in trees and made sugar out of it and horses and piles of manure and the smell of it and the cattle and the milk and the gardens and the sawing lumber and yeah. So I was a goner at that point in a way that their own kids, their own kids had it, you know, all of my peers in high school around Vermont kind of had to go to New York or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and and that left a vacuum and an opportunity for me to study with some great masters of using manure well. 
They, you know, they pickled it with grass in the gutter and they added uh, ingredients. And I discovered early on, you could, uh, if you like shoveling manure, they'd let you shovel all morning. They'd give you a pretty good lunch. They'd let you shovel all afternoon. You could run the team or the tractor and they'd give you money actually too. So how did that become Vermont compost? Uh, so then I, I wanted to farm my own piece of land, which was growing up to trees and shallow in places. And so I, I started clearing it and taking manure to Habs from neighbors and realized I had to learn some stuff pretty quick. One thing I learned was that my cow farm was by any measure when I got it all out there, an eight or 10 cow farm, and it was not going to be easy to intersect with dairy as a theme. And so I, 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 I just got interested in vegetables, uh, you know, and it was by, and started growing vegetables. And that, that was, I guess I first got certified in Vermont as a you know, the, the farm overall in, in 84. And by that point we actually were raising replacement heifers and we were, we really were into the manure end of the thing to drive the vegetable thing. Um, because that became the limit of what we could grow was what how much compost we could apply. And so by sharecropping hay on both sides of the mountain there for older farmers who didn't really have the help, we could pasture everything on Berkshire and uh, um, and then focus the manure on the on the arable part of the rotation. Um, that's, that's kind of where I learned, where I learned how important it was to me to, have, you know, I mean, we, I, I was farming soils that needed to be plumped up to say the least. So, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd mob it with cattle, we'd put the hay right to it. And, and we had a, not too far away, a chair stock mill that sawed hardwood, you know, in post mills, they sawed hardwood. And in order to do that, this, this was for, you know, furniture stock and pallet stock and so on. They, um, they debarked the logs so they wouldn't dull the blades. So they had a big debarker and they had bark. And the guy who took the bark away from the debarker laid it all out on a, like a nine acre bench, sandy bench on a brook. And it didn't flood. It was a high bench that hadn't flooded, you know, since white folks got here. And, uh, and he laid it all out by species. Now he could have been a guy, he was a librarian, not a, not a pyramid builder. He could have been a guy who wanted to build a ramp to heaven with all the barks. Cause they had, you know, they're sawing 10, 12 species of things, <laughs> but instead he laid it out like a library. So here was this library of bark by species and age. And if you want to load your own truck, it was free. You know, if, if they brought the big pettibone down, they charge you 25 cents a yard or something. But, and you know, the eight yard bucket would drop a yard and a half on your truck and surround you like you were in a snow dump, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and you'd drive away. But I used to load my own because it, it you know, I, it, it, yeah. I, so I, I started betting cattle on bark by species as, as part of the bedding. Um, and I, we hardwood bark is one of our key ingredients still, you know, now the logs are debarked in Canada, they're Vermont logs going up into Quebec. And we've been buying that for 20 years to have the bark itself because the enzyme, you know, bark is a magic thing. It's the, it's the clothing a tree wears to face the world. It's got, uh, the bioactivity is very intense in, in certain barks. And we know that newly cleared out of certain kinds of woods, vegetables really thrive. Uh, so we've always favored certain, you know, well, maple is one of our key one, yellow birch. Um, and these all have, uh, they sweeten the process and sweetening. It should be sweet. It should be attractive. And, and then of course, since logs are always dragged through the woods, we know that the mycorrhizal input from the bark was substantial sport in terms of sport. Cause you're picking up soil as, yeah. as they're being dragged through the wood. In the last 30 years, logging has changed a lot. And you know, the, the grapple skitter and the feller buncher and so on, the, uh, the tops are dragged, but the log is not anymore, which changed that dynamic, um, for sure. Um, but we, we, we believe we've insulated ourselves from the, that problem in that sense. But well, first of all, I think there's, but remember that mycorrhizal partnership with plants in many instances extends throughout the plant. When you say that, you mean that those those mycorrhizal funguses are getting up into the plant? They, they, we, we now know something that turns what any of us learned in the first textbooks we read about soil, that that by mycorrhizal um, service provision, plants move amino acids directly uh, to the chloroplast without resorting to making to any nitrification. Okay. And that was always said to be not possible. 
But this is a, a mycorrhizal service that, and it requires them, yeah, mycorrhizal actors to be at the apical tip where it's growing. Really? Yeah. So, so we're we're at a, uh, but we're we're in a very interesting science time for for n- new stuff that supports things that people have talked about and written about for ten thousand years. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I'm talking now about glomalin. You're familiar with the word glomalin? I'm familiar with it, but I'm I'm drawing a blank on yeah, exactly I, what it is. Well, glomalin got named in uh, glomalin is the glue that holds the world together. It's what it's it's what makes tilts, what what makes it aggregate. So people have looked for little beads forming, you know, aggregation and of soil and said, ah, yes, this is rich loam. OK, glomalin is a complex polysaccharide. It is a gl- a gl- named after uh, glomalase, which is the larger group of fungal actors that includes mycorrhizal fun- fungi. So glomalin is a, 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 a complex carbon and protein compound, sugar, et cetera, um, co- compound that's synthesized utilizing sugar from photosynthesis, root exuded by the plant, to make what's called the glomalin sheath, which enables mycorrhizae means mushroom root. And they, are, they can be two decimal orders of magnitude smaller than anything a plant can produce. So a hundred times smaller. So it's very hard for them to reach from one sand grain to the next, even in silty soils or clay. You know, so, so in order to be rigid enough to make the penetration they need to do the foraging, they produce this glomalin sheath and they go get the water and the phosphorus and the other things, bring it to the plant. And as the root goes rushing by, by hyphae diet, you know, they're relatively short lived, uh, the, the, the feeder hyphae. And when they die, the glomalin sloughs off and, uh, and becomes stable carbon glue in the soil. Um, up to 30% of carbon, we used to think it was humus. That was a broad term that we knew some things about. But these polysaccharides, and now we're discovering there are others. Um, um, are, are, are literally the glue that holds the world together. They're how you would hold, this is how we draw down CO2 and stash it for long periods in soil. That'll be one of the main components. And the good news, it's the glue that holds it together. It's what gives it loft and prevents it from getting compaction. And it finally puts some science under some of our, you know, the ob- observations we've made about, oh, things like rototillers. What happens when you rototill? Well, you chop up all the hyphae that could, you know, you really start screwing with it, the network, okay? And now you you also, you release all these bacterial children from any manners that the nuns were providing, right? Uh, or the school teachers or whatever you want to call the fungal tenders of the bacteria. And they start eating glomalin and whoo! Glomalin is good, man. It tastes well because it's sugar, yeah. right? I mean, it's, well, it's, it's polysaccharides. It's it's complex. It's carbon, but yeah, okay. Uh, and and it's not sugar in as glomalin, but it can turn into sugar when it when bacteria get at it. Um, it it, it uh, and and um, it was made from sugar, right? So you know, and in 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 life generally, things made from sugar can be made into sugar. I mean, carbon, you know, uh, and that's one of the interesting things as we face the the plague of finely divided plastic you know stay tuned for what sort of inimical biota may develop <laughs> to live on plastic and afflict us or other soil organisms maybe it's going to be much more benign than that the mangroves are said to be tearing down polyethylene now really five years is what i hear the ecology of mangroves has figured it out. And, you know, uh, uh, if you looked at a year 2000 plastics engineering handbook, they're still talking about four to 500 years for polyethylene. And, you know, they used to say never, never bioaccessible. I remember having, a you know, people who claim to be knowledgeable about biochemistry patiently explain that my concern that 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 bio communities would metabolize plastics was because I didn't really understand the impregnability of long chain carbon molecules. And the truth is that, you know, they were right. I didn't have the training that they had in, in microbiology, but you know, well, you locked up a bunch of carbon and there aren't a lot of carbon sources that are eternally unavailable diamonds. Maybe if that, if that's the case, I've never had a chance to try to compost any diamonds, you know, but, <laughs> but, but plastic bag and chicken 
you know, I mean, that's, you know, it seemed to me you'd end up with slimy diamonds, you know, but it, I'd love the chance. I would. So let's, let's circle back here, Carl. I mean, th- cause this is, this is interesting to me. I mean, you've, I mean, talking to you about compost is yeah, back is, to Vermont compost. I mean, okay. Back to Vermont yeah. compost. Cause, cause you, I mean, you've developed into, I think it would be fair to say an artist of compost, but you've got, and you, you're sitting here in the late eighties, you know, growing vegetables. And how does, how does that turn into Vermont compost company? Well, uh, so we're growing vegetables. We're re- doing Christmas trees too. Cause, and we're, we, we, we're retailing Christmas trees in the big city and using real estate in times square that belongs to a, you know, a guy who's sort of gentrifying what used to be called hell's kitchen is now Clinton. And we were sort of part of the flora and fauna, you know, wreath making and storefronts and, you know, b- bagged in burlap trees and maple syrup and, you know, like that. And well, it was Midtown. It was good for us, theater district. And, um, he, uh, in about 87, he says, uh, how about we start a compost company? Cause he and his wife fox hunted with the Golden's bridge hounds. And, uh, he became aware that pulling a 30 yard dumpster of horse manure and bracket hound manure, uh, by the garbage man, this is 87, 86, 87 was costing them 600 bucks a pull. They would get paying $20 a yard to have horse manure removed, which, you know, in, in that area was, um, the fully burdened cost of an hour of a good driver's time. So the garbage men were doing murder. So we, I, and I was on my hill in Berkshire and it was kind of working. We were selling Christmas trees and doing this and that, which is, you know, novel length saga probably we were making a thing in in this enchanted valley mountain surrounded by woods as clean as it gets top of the watershed um never been chemically touched by you know the the malice of industrial agriculture never been near it it had been abandoned before that and i was starting to i was i guess in retrospect run you know wanting more impact as it were socially does that make any sense that totally makes sense. And so when this siren call from the tycoon in Manhattan said, let's, yeah, let's go, let's build, put a compost business together and start removing horse manure from stables and make some compost. And so we were off to the races. That became a business called Moody Hill Farms, which was named after the Berkshire Farm, which was Moody Hill Farm, which okay. was a, the Moody family settled it in the 17 whatevers and uh, we liked the name and and that and that's an ongoing business called McEnroe Organics that we compete directly against in the potting soil business so not so directly New York's a big market and we divvy it up a bit some people anyway um that was 80 so so I started with with partners a compost business and we were doing uh you know very we ended up doing a lot of food with the culinary Institute of America, the CIA in Hyde park. We, that was, uh, that was 40 active kitchens, six restaurants or something. Um, after five years down in that wild New York scene and that business got pretty substantial. We were growing, we were, we had 300 acres of tillage. There were probably 60 acres of row crops happening. Um, so the vegetable side got very big. The roadside stand is now a very serious thing on route 22. But but um, we got pregnant and we're not really thrilled with the neighborhood the way. Yeah, it's it's that's, a, again, a long story, that five year period. But um, so I, I we fled home to Vermont, you know, back to the mountain <laughs> to to have our you know son. And um, and I kind of was prepared to take that year. And I, I kind of developed the notion as I was you know, taking most of that year off. I did a little consulting that year to the Intervail Foundation, Will Rapp Gardener Supply. You know, they had uh, an aspirational compost project that, be you know, on goes today as Green Mountain, which, well, when we talk about embodied cost of composting, this is, a, this is emerging as a very, very important conversation because that's, you know, two and a half million dollars of we the people's money poor expressed as concrete and sucking and blowing by with computer control. And one thing you're not going to do is return it to agriculture any moment soon. Um, it escalates the cost of management in ways and, and, and then begs some fundamental questions about compost 
uh, quality. I think the, you know, these the, the big industrial approach. Um, I, I think we really need pretty diffuse approaches anyway. That, uh, that's, you know, so, so Vermont compost. So I am started to envision this network, you know, the whole idea that we would, it, it, Vermont's a rural state with, without a lot of concentration. So this needed to be relatively small facilities that didn't exceed either of the local supply of appropriately surplus ingredients that were being wasted in some way or squandered and the site capacities, you know, and that the machinery weighs less than the material. So we'll schlep the machinery from site to site and the material should be managed as close to its point of generation as possible. Um, we, we started to do that. I ended up early on in Vermont compost. We did a lot of work for Ben and Jerry's as, as I was consulting to the Intervale about developing their compost project, the Intervale foundation. I was also consulting to Ben and Jerry's about dealing with, uh, you know, the, the, the ice cream is very high in fat oil and grease fogs and fogs overwhelm wastewater treatment plants very quickly. Cause the, so, uh, we developed a strategy because the, City of Burlington and Chittenden Solid Waste had had a huge amount of leaves. Um, we started mixing leaves with ice cream, waste ice cream. And, you know, every time they change flavor, they got to wash the pipes. Uh, and it's pretty benign. They do various the solvent, you know, the things that the acid washes and so on are all compostable things. We got to do a lot of work about making sure, you know, just understanding what the other small ingredients were that we needed to know about. And, and we, so we started doing ice cream in several places around the state for Ben and Jerry's. And so, um, that, that actually provided us a cash flow that was pretty helpful, uh, initially as a consultancy. And then as we started to develop sites to service other Ben and Jerry's plants around. So, you know, we were doing St. Albans up at Intervale, but we were doing Springfield. Well, and so I, I permitted sites in different places, Heartland, Versher, uh, North Springfield, uh, East Montpelier, Montpelier. Then, then, you know, then we kind of focused, well, the farm in Montpelier offered itself, uh, you know, so my Venezuelan born mother of my son was on a mountain in Berkshire and I was driving 75 miles up to the Intervale to consult. Uh, and, you know, she discovered Montpelier actually, um, cause she got, yeah, she picked up the kid and got in the car and went to a town and started said, all right, you know, Berkshire is beautiful, but with an infant and you're going to be working. <laughs> And she, you know, so she, she found a co-housing group and somebody had bought the piece of land. Well, where she's, she's still in the house that I rented at a certain point as an office in Montpelier because it was midway between Berkshire and Burlington. And then we ended up moving into that office space and she's been living there ever since. And I bought the next piece of land up the hill. Well, we bought the next piece of land up the hill and um, then we separated, but stayed, you know, 600 feet apart so the kid could commute and that worked pretty well, actually. We're, we're still neighbors. And uh, uh, so that got us on a hill in Montpelier, which was, well, I, you know, I was, I grew up on a hill farm. And so it didn't, it, you know, that seems to be my karma is hill farms. I, I know about bottom land and I've even gotten to plow a little bit of it a couple of times. <laughs> you know that it exists. I've heard of it. You can verify well, you that. You know, bottomland envy in Vermont. Uh, people been nailed so hard on a lot of bottomland. I mean, there's exceptions. You know, the big Hadley benches on the Connecticut that don't flood, and the Connecticut is a managed flow stream. So, you know, there there are some land of Goshen spots in Vermont, but the bottom, uh, you know, painstakingly built bottom land up where the river can't reach, you know, <laughs> and the views are better if you make your own bottom land on top, but that's kind of where I've had to be at, you know, it's like, well, nobody gave me any Hadley silt loam, but I can read a book and I know what Hadley silt loam is made out of. And by Gumpy, I can go out shopping and bring it all together. Hey, <laughs> And so that's what you started doing there. Is well, you started- yeah, well, I, we started, well, we, we, and that's kind of where we started, you know, we, so we, we, I bought it as a homestead and I was on lease land on a dairy or I had a partnership on, on a dairy farm where we were getting manure and we were making potting soil there, which was the product that, that really intrigued starting, you know, all the, yeah, Vermont was, uh, so what year was that? We, so 92, 93 started m- making, living on the farm we're on now on main street, 96, I bought a piece of it. And by then I was making potting soil at in East Montpelier at, at a site. I had built a, a place called Lyle Haven farm, which 
Well, another part of my karma seems to be real estate typhoons. Uh, that, that was the show farm of a Massachusetts realtor named Jerome Lyle Rappaport, hence uh, 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 Lyle Haven Farm. Right. He had a very cagey manager at that time, um, Holstein. Uh, you know how some people are are, are gifted? So um, he, he was the guy who with the gift of deciding which cow has really got the confirmation, uh, actually. Uh, and, uh, he had been studying composting. They'd even had a study done that said they should be composting their manure, which they were having periodically a local contractor bulldoze off into a gully above the Winooski river. And they were, their crop manager, like having agri crop services come they were giving him kickbacks, you know, in cash and he was buying fertilizer and he didn't like spreading manure. <laughs> so, uh, I got there and there's like a 6,000 yard pile of manure bulldozed to the edge of this gully. It hasn't been bulldozed off. It's first for some reason, because the contractor was also kicking back. They never moved anything once there. They'd first, they'd make a big pile and then they'd push it off. Right. You know, the billing thing <laughs> had gotten really out of control. Anyway, I built I built a really good compost facility. We had USDA. It was the first uh, car, equip cost share. It wasn't called equip then, but Bruce Chappell and I built it. And they didn't have any planning capability for composting. They barely had heard the word <laughs> back then. Um, but it was a, it was it was an interesting. Anyway, I was making potting soil there and said real estate. Typhoon started looking at the numbers because we had I'd started they, you know, selling compost to halves with him. He provided machinery, equipment, everything. I supervised the building of the site. He bought a loader for the project kind of thing. Right. Well, he started looking at the potting soil numbers where, you know, I had built I had built a separate facility, paved, a, built a taken over a shed. No one was using, cleaned it up and um was making potting soil and he was getting 10% of that. Well, he got interested at a certain point. He's a, you know, very busy guy, not around much developing West Boston, big time. Right. And the 128 circle, a lot of industrial parks and the rest of it. Um, but he, he's a sharp, he's one of the sharpest arithmetic minds I've ever bumped into for sure. Um, not anymore. Jerry's Jerry's coming 90, but, um, um, He's still pretty sharp in his way. He's got a minder that apparently his arithmetic is slipping. But he started looking. He said, all right, I want a bigger piece of this potting soil thing right away here. <laughs> this compost thing is a commodity where we're, we got shitty margin. This potting soil thing. So I had to get out of there. OK, so now we're making potting soil. We got a market and we bought this. Well, another hill farm right now. You know, I, OK, so here's here's a piece of ground right on main street in a capital city in these United States leave out that it's barely a city, you know, it's barely. Yeah. I mean, not till yours. A, it's a, I've been there a couple of times. It's a tiny little town. Well, it's 8,500 people sleep there, but you know, on a bad day, 20,000 people are trying to have lunch, right. Or pass through. Uh, and you know, when legislation is legislature is in session and all of that, but yeah, it's the tiniest state capital in one of the tiniest states, but it is a state in these United States and a farm on main street in the capital city of a state in these United States, you know, certainly would have cachet in China. And when it offered itself, at, you know, next door to the piece we were already farming and sort of put together the core of the old, the original farm, um, it was hard to pass up, even though it was by no means obviously ideal for a compost business. It was, well, it was a beautiful little hill farm, top of the watershed, nice sugar bush, all on, you know, that, that piece was 18 acres, you know, combined it made about 47 acres, but, and the price was plausible and I just couldn't see my way. To, and the, and it wasn't on the market that owners wanted to sell it. And they'd been there for three generations and more, Clara had. Um, I bought it anyway, in spite of whatever, you know, the tumble down 1820s house and barn and stood the barn up and, well, started making some compost there because, well, we, we already had, I had a pretty good flock of equines at that point and we, you know, but 25 chickens, I'd never tried to do chickens for money. Um, so in that sense, I think of myself as a pretty new chicken farmer because uh, I didn't try to m sell eggs, a lot of eggs or anything as a real thing till 98. 
And when we bought a couple hundred birds and started, and by then I was uh, going around town uh, picking up. Well, it started with the Horn of the Moon Cafe and Gary Beardsworth. I'll give give him credit here. The Horn of the Moon was one of the oldest, longest serving vegetarian restaurants in New England. It it had a twenty five or so year run till Barry um, through through a couple ownerships and. Um, Gary was really committed, wanted to do composting. It's right down there on Langdon Street. So he set up a little three bin pallet system right against the wall in this historic building on Langdon Street, right on, on the river. And he started composting the leftover, you know, whatever. They, they did a lot of whole prep. It was brown rice and lots of and scale, all that stuff. And on, you know, on day two or three, the, somebody panicked about a rat and the health officer showed up and they were going to close the restaurant, you know, and Gary called me and said, can you use any, you know, I got to get this stuff out of here. And I said, yeah, bring it up. We'll feed it to the chickens. Right. Let's see. So uh, Gary started dropping off the compostables from the cafe on his way home, which was past our door and chickens, you know, really thrive on that kind of feed. Uh, uh, we had more graining ours anyway, but I realized I could feed more chickens than I had. You know, we were, our, we also would do a lot of whole prep and grow food. So, you know, keep, you could, we weren't buying grain for 20 chickens. We had, well, there was a little grain around typically cause kept some, yeah, they probably got some grain in those days without thinking, you know, without us thinking about it a lot, but, um, I never liked buying a lot of grain ever in my life. Never, like, they never took to buying grain. It just always seemed wrong. So at this point you've got, 25 chickens. You got a bunch of horses. No, not horses, donkeys, mules, donkeys and mules. Yeah. Donkeys and mules. And, and you're bringing in manure from, from dairy farms. You're in the potting soil business. You start getting stuff in from restaurants in, in, uh, in Montpelier. Yeah. And I'm pretty, at a certain point I'm, so there I am and I'm, I'm, I've got a big team of Amish mules that are road, you know, Pennsylvania road, road warriors, older guys, calm, especially the lead mule, you know, totally calm. Right. And so, I, and I got an old new idea, shit spreader, ground driven, just a, you know, hitch to a pioneer four cart and I'm delivering eggs and potting soil to the co-op. Um, and picking up five gallon pails now from several places in town. And then, then, you know, pretty quickly, the problem is that and embarrassing my, my poor kid picking him up at school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it really, it, you know, America and it's time. Um, so he's embarrassed. Oh, dad, come on. But I'm on the back swing from the co-op. It's time to pick him up. Right. And all the other kids want to ride so bad they can taste it. Right. Cause you're, so oh wait, hold on. You're, you're, you're driving your manure spreader into well, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't have beaters on it. It's an old running gear, new oh. idea. It's a wooden wagon, a long one. Nice, really good yeah. in town work. The old new idea It was called new idea. It's an old new idea because it had such a brilliant frame that weighed so little and was so strong. And you're driving the donkeys into, the, into town. These are big Amish draft mules. Don- no. Amish draft mules. Yeah, big yeah. ones, you know, they can stand up in traffic that are traffic skilled. I bought them. I bought those when Sid was about, I went to Pennsylvania and bought a couple, well, that team. So yeah. And we were driving them around town cause that's what we, well, we were, we were, you know, they were, I was mowing with them and I was plowing with them and I was farming with them that, you know, I mean, our, our little homesteading farming that we were doing and taking over this hill farm and start, you know, we had a pretty serious garlic thing going on still. Cause you know, unwinding from the New York, New York was a lot of edge and, you know, vegetable. And, and I consider myself one of the primary, you know, the founders of professional vegetable growers anonymous. And we used to actually have a t-shirt, you know, professional vegetable growers anonymous. And it said, you know, I can quit anytime. Right. <laughs> and when you go to meetings and you have these terrible things, you know, guy is just admitting that, um, he, he, he broke down. He doesn't know how it happened, but the next thing, you know, he wakes up, his wife is screaming at him. When did you order these seeds? And he doesn't remember. And he apparently kind of went in the bathroom and with a Johnny's catalog and the credit card and, you know, indulged <laughs> some crazy fantasy of vegetable empire and, and, and didn't even remember it. And, you know, that this was ch- tough on the relationship anyway. <laughs> you, you laugh, but not. So. <laughs> oh, no, I only I only laugh because I know. Well, you um, know, we always as potting soil vendors. Now I'm an enabler. OK. Uh, all right. So then so there we are. And 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 the thing is kind of or, 
dare I say this, growing organically. May as well. Um, and and at early on, you know, Gardner's Supply, which is Will Rapp's company in Burlington, they decided they needed they wanted to sell some potting soil, and they hadn't really looked at it very hard. And initially, you know, around '96 or well, believe this, you know, Joey Klein, right? Well, yeah, because Joey Joey was was the rep that we dealt with back when on my farm when we were Vermont compost dealers. In '96, the bagging crew was me and Joey. '97, and we were, you know, what had happened was uh, gardeners had come to us and they had started with a different product and it was a cow manure product and it was heat sealed in a regular plastic bag and and it was immature and it got delivered to them and it would the bag would swell and then you'd poke a hole in it and it would smell like you know a terrible backup of the toilet or something so they couldn't ship this stuff so they asked the vendor to do it again you know give them something that didn't do that and the vendor replaced it with stuff that did do that we didn't have a bag that was appropriate size. We were bagging only in a 60 quart bag for growers, you know, big grain bag. And so I put a 20 quart bag from my bag vendor, uh, on their dock with product, um, uh, and, you know, um, and a sewing label in 10 days. Okay. Da-da, 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 you know, and it was good. You know, people liked it and it was good potting. So it was Ford V. And that was me and Joey with a three, uh, Carl Bielenberg welded up a, a three bag jig with a square funnel and we, and we put leading edges on five gallon pails <laughs> steel, you know, we'd really very, pop. very sophisticated operation. Very, here. very, very sophisticated, really, really highly uh, effective and old technology. Stable technologies are good. You know, that's why we like plant mycorrhizal relationship. It's a 500 million year old technology that, you know, hasn't been in beta for a long time. And, and that bagging thing, you know, the bag, we used to make a lot of jokes about bagging because we had the, we bag it associates. Cause we, 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 we didn't want to own, we didn't own a crew. We had uh, freelancers who got paid piecework and they were bagging contractors and they were supposed to aspire to own their sewing machines. We didn't want to heat seal anything because even though the bag people insist that you're supposed to get a certain amount of polyethylene vapor in your life where you're not protected against modern life, the heat sealing machine, yeah, yeah I wouldn't want to hover over one. So we no. didn't want to put the material in a bag that didn't, because it was alive and breathing, even though its respiration is slow. And so we put it in a woven bag that we could oh. sew. That, yeah, it was me and Joey. Yeah, bagging. That's hard to believe nowadays. We have a bagging machine, though we still we only ever bought one. We have an old roto bagger. We don't we try not to do lots and lots of bagging. But gardeners in those years was it took right off and we were filling trail loads all the time. They were an enormous percentage of my business between them and Ben and Jerry's. I often felt like I was sort of going to bed at night with a couple of more or less well-intentioned elephants. But, you know. <laughs> 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 but they did roll around when they were having nightmares of various kinds. And you never, you know, you never were sure they remembered you were there. Uh, uh, that nowadays, you know, now I, I have, we have, I don't know, I think 500 commercial green, uh, growing operations that are the core of our business. And we love that. We love them. And then, none, and, and, and no one of them can take us down. So tell me, tell me about that, how you guys moved into the commercial potting soil market. Because I mean, I know my farm, we came to you guys when we bought a mechanical soil block maker. This was in 2001. And we were, we were still using our, our old, uh, Elliot Coleman recipe for soil blocks that we'd been using for hand blocks. And it, and it just wasn't working. And I was, I was tearing my hair out and I, I talked to the guy that sold me the machine and he said, well, you know, you need to get in touch with the guys at Vermont compost and, and try buying, you know, try some of their soil and see if that works. Well, we were in Iowa and we're sitting here buying compost from Vermont. And I was, I was a little take, taken aback by it, but it worked, you know, and it worked really well. How did you guys get the kind of reach that you've got with a hillside composting operation from Vermont? Well, I actually remember exactly in terms of the upper Midwest, because it started with uh, Farmer John at Angelic. OK, and he had been he had been to Holland and bought a Visser machine, I believe. And yes. um, and and because you got yours from Pete Seely, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah we got so, ours from Pete. So, 
so John had been to the Netherlands and Visser had probably four machines or five in the United States and three of them were in Vermont. And actually one of those was a Dewa, but they're all hooked up. And um, so on his way back from Holland, having shipped his mach- blocking machine, John Peterson, he never actually came to Vermont compost, but he went to Bruce Kaufman and, uh, well, there was a guy in Charlotte had a machine I've, and, and, and they were all using Fort V cause it's a blocking mix. And, you know, we, we had developed that mix. Well, it, it, also living in Berkshire in the eighties was Elliot Coleman, who was farm manager of the mountain school. And so when I was a young farmer in Berkshire growing, trying to grow vegetables, there was Elliot at the mountain school trying, you know, growing the, the food for the school, which, you know, he thought was the coolest kind of CSA is where the community is right there. Boom you know, and even willing to help pick up hay. And so the mountain school to this day grows a lot of its food. Um, But Elliot had brought, he'd gone to England and brought the Ladbroke blockers back and he'd been to Holland. And so there in the early eighties, and we, we realized that the potting soils you could buy commercially, not only weren't they organic and not only didn't you want to grow food in them, you didn't even want to stick your hands in it. I mean, nobody would even tell you what was in it. Uh, that it was all proprietary and it certainly wasn't organic. And I, at the time in the farm in Berkshire, cause I had gone from the, remember the bark story of bringing these species specific barks. The first new piece of farm equipment I ever bought was a Valby chipper. It was a Finnish three point hitch, heavy thing. It was like a Paypack corn chopper, three big blades in a cowling and you could feed brush into it and it would make chips or, and it had, but it had a nine inch throat. You could put, if you had tractor enough, you had 90 horsepower, you could chip nine inch softwood anyway. And uh, I didn't have that much horsepower. I had about 40 on a John Deere, but you could, if you cut it short enough, you could chip anything. And I didn't want to be burning anything anymore. I wanted to put the wood in the land as I cleared the woods. And then I kind of got really into the compost part and I decided, well, I want to be able to put not only species specific bedding under my critters, but also size specific because the whole carbon nitrogen ratio and the ratio of vascular tissue. So, you know, when you start talking CN ratios uh, uh, at the core of a white pine, the CN ratio might be 500 to one at the apical tip of that same tree. It might be eight to one. Uh, in terms of, you know, carbon nitrogen ratio. So I hadn't really thought of that, but that, that makes sense. I guess that makes sense. But I hadn't really thought that there would be that much difference. Tree, but tree has, obviously tree has huge anatomy. So, you know, if you say to somebody, Hey, the secret to my potting soil success is bark. And I've heard, and people have said to me, Oh, Oh, we have sawdust or we have wood chips. That would be like, if I said, Hey, the secret to my chicken pot pie is thigh meat. And you say, Oh yeah, yeah. We got feathers. So because also then you choose the time of year. Do you want the leaves or don't you want the leaves when, you know, in, in your when you're optimizing a rain meal? Rain meal is from the French, Remache, you know, a rain meal is English, old English agrarian term for small brushwood um, rain meal. Ramiel, right. Um, and um, and Cornell's been doing it. And, and then Université Laval, Cornell started in 1980 or something, 82, maybe uh, putting various applications of wood chip, which again, wood chip is a very nonspecific noun in, you know, it doesn't tell you much about its size or how old it, the species were, or what's happened to it. Um, but they, then they, they, they refined it and they said, well, it should be Ramiel and, 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 um, and Cornell defined Ramiel is uh, I think three inch minus. And, and then when Laval took up the work in the nineties, um, Anyway, long story short, 10 tons of rain meal to the acre, if you're in continuous tillage, will increase vegetable yields over time significantly <laughs> and retain um, the, you know, the fungal and organic. You know, it helps to put some long term hang on to the organics in the soil. Wood is good. Right. Too much wood can have nitrogen demand. And there's the you know, there's the thing. Um, and uh, but but uh, it. The giving from the forest to the field. Um, okay. So we were making potting soils and my goal at the time was not to import anything onto the farm for making that potting soil. Okay. So we were out in the, you know, we had these, we'd go out in the woods and we'd harvest willow duff. So you pull the leaves, you know, and, and then you get the decomposition decompo- below the leaves and you harvest that and you put the leaves back and yellow birch duff. And, and we were making, um, blocking mixes out of this stuff to hand block. Um, 
and um, and 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 also, you know, we were we were we had a, we were into clones of certain things. So we were making, you know, that's why we got so interested in the willow duff because root tone, any of that comes from willow, bar, you know. Oh, you know, ever, you know how twigs are, right? So anything a root and willow duff. Yeah, we we actually had a product going that, you know, it's in a funny way, it's been uh, another 30 years of trying to get anywhere clo- close to as wonderful at industrial scale or small industrial scale, because we're we're definitely a boutique, um, um, com- you know, in, in, in our business, because our business is a lot about big volumes at pretty thin margins. Mostly that's the compost business. And, we, you know, always that if there's a subsidy, the more there is paid for tipping, probably the less you want it in your product. Right. <laughs> and, and and so, you know, and, and when I wrote a, a mission statement at a certain point for the Intervale Foundation, I wrote they jettisoned this mission statement many years ago, but I wrote that composters stand as gatekeepers to the soil and that there's a really, you know, the leaving out the things that we can't manage is one of the most important responsibilities. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's like, why would you, you, well, it's why you'd send a f- farmer to buy produce for you. You know, like when, uh, uh, when Dave Perkins suddenly realized he was a truck, he had a trucking network and was delivering boxes. This is at Vermont Valley. You know, Dave and Barb went and bought citrus in Florida for the good people of Madison. Who else would you rather have buying your citrus for you? If you live in Madison, then your local, really smart, knowledgeable, organic farmer going and meeting farmers in Florida. Right. Um, so in that sense, you know, that's one of the trusts you might want to place in your composter is that they're, they're really watching it for you. Um, cause it, at a, at a critical part of your whole, I mean, it's, it, we, we recognize that we, we, we accept a lot of responsibility to, to meet performance and, and, and even ethical, um, goals for, for our customers. Um, uh, it's, uh, it is, I think certainly part of where the rubber meets the road out there in the future, whether we can really make farm the, the, the recycling of these valuable nutrients, um, farm truly long-term soil friendly. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of disquieting action going on. Some people say, Oh, don't worry. The microbes will work it out for us. And there's, you know, I, I love, I, I have a lot of faith in, 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 in microbial adaptability. I do, I do, I do. Um, whether, you know, I, I think it's still imprudent to allow, for instance, unlimited broken pieces of plastic into the soil. Um, I think resisting that because I think it's going to come down to being a matter of loading, you know, it, it frequently does. And, um, um, but, um, okay. So John Peterson went out to Caledonia with his machine and wow, he's, you know, we sent five pallets of bagged, uh, Fort V and it costs more to get it there than the material cost. And, um, 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 so, you know, they went along the first couple of years there growing the so-called the important crops in the Vermont compost, which did really well. And then they bought a sequence of they bought compost and made the Elliot Coleman recipe or they, you know, in parentheses, Elliot and Barbara have been buying potting soil from us since almost the beginning because Elliot has said right along, I make it more reliable and cheaper. And he picks up the phone and gets it there. Right. Um, and, um, and Elliot has been saying so in workshops all, well, that's another reason that, you know, it, uh, Elliot's, Elliot's interns spread out across the farming world in our region and, and other regions, and, and they were accustomed to using it and it worked for them and they get their new job. And why would you want to start a greenhouse production job and not have the potting soil that you're really confident in? You know, it's, uh, uh but, um, but so and then, uh, then along came a guy named Bob. Remember Bob at Angelic Ponytail, Big yeah. Bob, washed yep. out of the Chicago Loop. He was a commodities trader or something. Fetched up at Angelic the way people do if they're if they in Chicago. And what do we do with Bob? You know, on the farm, well, we'll make him business manager. And 
Bob is out in a greenhouse one day and he's looking at plants and he says, what, what's going on here? These are robust and beautiful. These over here look terrible. What, what's happening? Oh, well, these are the important crops that are growing in the Vermont compost, which is more precious than life itself. And these are the other crops that are less important. Are, you know, and Bob said, what costs money out here is y'all in the heat, right? <laughs> it's like, we don't have any unimportant crops. It should all look like that, which is when ding dong, you know, duh, the, We discover that trucking in America has two retail, you know, less than truckload, LTL, and then whole trailers, which if you're on the East Coast, everybody needs to get back to Chicago. They're empty and they don't have anything to haul back to Chicago. And if you can put something on a truck to get to the Midwest, it doesn't pay for the truck. It just pays fuel and driver if they're lucky. And as assuming you send it one spot and they unload it. So selling, sending 25 skids out to Caledonia costs about the same as sending five or seven, which tips the balance. So, okay. So there's Angelic getting trailer loads. David Perkins comes down to visit his old friend, John Peterson, because David's family is from Beloit area. Anyway, they knew each other pretty well. And David called up and I'd never heard of him. And he wanted to order and he ordered a truckload of soil. And without much discussion, okay, David later said, you know, whatever he'd been doing, and I I don't think he, I I don't recollect. Um, Anyway, you know, the bottom line on this is that in 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 the cost structure of a greenhouse, the media is typically less money than the plant material, right? You know, and heat, labor, and overhead become the big things. So if the media fails, you should have stayed in bed drinking something you like to drink and fantasizing about something other than greenhouse crops, because if the media fails, it's all sunk costs. So it can't be overstated how important it is, right? Absolutely. And and clearly going forward, every region needs competence at this. Um, so we never expected to hold a market in the upper Midwest. And, and there, there are some people, I mean, we've been, as you might imagine, well, they came at us hard at a certain point. We're not going to add enough organic matter by adding it to the soils to draw down the CO2. We need to add organic matter, compost and other things to soils in strategies that enable the sequestration by plants as glomalin, as liquid carbon. What you know, liquid carbon is the sugar squirting into the soil. Rapidly growing plants can utilize up to 80 percent of its solar income as root exuded carbon compounds. So that's the liquid carbon. That's, that's how we draw down. We increase. That's pump. That's pumping the carbon yeah, into so the soil. Yeah, so that's the second phase. The, the compost is the first stage of the rocket, the compost, the cover crop, these, all these things that we, that, that sets the stage for the liquid carbon phasing when the multiple plant communities working in concert draw down CO2 from the air and put it into stable forms that glues the soil back together so it won't blow away so that we can have safe tillage, as it were, soil safe tillage. More than half of anthropogenic CO2 is from 10,000 years of soil abuse in farm and forest. Less than half comes from the burning of fossils. Fossils have enabled soil abuse at a level the Romans only dreamt of when they were desertifying the Fertile Crescent with their invention of the horse collar and monocropping wheat. The crime is still soil abuse more than fossil fuel combustion. And the only mechanism big enough, terrestrial mechanism, there's some ocean mechanisms, but the only terrestrial mechanism big enough is a combination of farm and forestry, which finally the Yale School of Forestry has recognized needs to be thought of as the same discipline in in long rotations. So, Carl, tell me a little bit about how the waste flows through your farm. And so you guys get in, you get in manures, you get in food, you're getting in uh, the, the bark and, and what happens when it, when it hits Vermont compost company there in Montpelier? Well, we, first of all, the, the way we get food now, uh, and again, you know, when we were picking it up in five gallon pails from motivated clients, it was, uh, it was a beautiful thing. It's still a beautiful thing, but it's a little more challenged thing because it's coming now from, uh, you know, 80 stores, 
hospital, schools, restaurants, etc. Um, and and it's the, the so the food comes and and it, 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 there's a, a rendering body on a on a or on a roll off truck that goes around to each of these stops and the tote is tipped into a gondola and there's a high pressure hot water washer on the truck and the tote gets washed and um, and 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 the sawdust is distributed to you know and so the to the stops that care to use it so they can kind of put some sawdust in the bottom and cover with sawdust as they make their donations, as it were. We get about 10 48 gallon totes a week just from folks in Montpelier who come to our neighborhood drop off for compost because they live in apartments and they've figured out that um, you know Montpelier is a pay as you throw town. So uh, they can really save they can just do a lot better by bringing their compost up to us. So we have a pretty active community participation. A lot of people in Montpelier really loathe the idea of take, throwing their the husk of the whatever into the landfill when they know it should be, you know, they bring it up to right. us and they're feeding chickens and they can pick up eggs while they're there. And, um, um, and we've been, by the way, you know, I should say that at the farm, we've been producing eggs. Eggs have been for sale every day since 98. Um, and we don't buy grain for any, you know, for our birds. I mean, the occasional bag of scratch for roll call, literally, you know, a couple bags a year, it, it, we forget and we don't have scratch. And then if there's some young birds that we're training, we might have some scratch. But um, basically no grain that we buy. It all comes from the um, the combination of things. And when the, so when what I was trying to say is that nowadays the food kind of arrives as a slurry because the washing water from the tote washing is all in it and uh, it, it gets to be pretty high moisture, um, and probably about 14% solids, if that. So we have to contain it. it. When it dumps, it's kind of a soup and we dump it into a containment. Well, among other things, we bed our, our chicken houses with late cut hay, you know, what we call land care hay, uh, silicaceous, carbonaceous, very porous. And we like weed seed at that phase because you know, pickled hay is, is a great chicken delicacy. We, you know, what, so we bed on late cut hay and then the, 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 the bedding is harvested at intervals and frequently it's harvested on the schedule that the food comes so that we can put a layer of uh, hay at the base of a lagoon that also has bark in it. And finished compost is always involved because we're always, we, we want to add experience material as tuition. Uh, you know, so we're always bringing, there is no loss at, in terms of compost spoil, anything, you know, screenings and things that, that are not product quality go back to the front end to inform the process. And what we try to keep our, mature compost component in the front end up in the, you know, 10 ish percent of the mix. Um, so immediately this slurry gets there, we blend in dry horse manure, dry, you know, the, whatever cow manure we have, we, t we, we, may, we actually blend our horse manure, our cow manure, our bark, our hail, spoiled haylage. Uh, some, we get a certain amount of leaves from clean places in the fall, though less than we used to. Um, that's all made into what we call hot mix, which has already got a beginning of a thermophilic action happening. We mix that with the food, which stops the thermophilics. We, we blend that up and we put it into the opportunity for the birds to feed in what we call the pickle. We're looking for a little bit of a restricted airflow there. Uh, we want it to acidulate and stabilize proteins so that they don't volatilize as nitrogen. You know, once we go into full thermophilic, there's less for the birds to eat there, though they get a, a lot of benefit from the thermal, you know, because wintering birds in Vermont where they forage out of doors for their feed every day depends, among other things, on good thermal management of the windrows to support the birds. But in that pickle phase, we want to incorporate their excreta Birds require very high nutrient density to produce eggs. They're not cows, right? That's why pasturing birds is inherently limited in certain ways. And insects are one of, you know, insects and bugs and grubs, of course, are one of their main appropriate feed sources. When we talk about pasture fed poultry, we, in a, in a situation that's working well, they're getting a lot of insect protein or it isn't going to work very well. Um, uh, you're going to have to support that protein in other ways. But we're trying to get secondary um, metabolites in this lacto-fermentation because um, we feel like 
um, you know, stepping away from the from the food um, is well, well, it would be very unwholesome to try to feed it without we blend it up so that it's doesn't stick to their feet and it's, you know, getting air through it. And but but then we pack it a little bit and hay is really important. And this is something I learned you know, from the dairy farmers that were my neighbors when I was growing up that, you know, they betted a lot on poor quality hay. Everybody really sorted hay. So you had, you know, rowan for making milk and you had hay that was appropriate for heifers, but not bread heifers, young heifers, because you didn't want to feed bread, bread heifers, anything that was moldy. And you had hay that was, you know, that you wet down and you know, so that you manage the dust. And well, people tried not to make dusty hay, but hay went in the gutter a lot. Grass was a really good component to add to manure. So we're always trying to have a component that's grass Uh, again, because it supports ecologies that we know are plant friendly (laughs) that work in, you know, and that's what we want to do is we want to be protected by our partners, um, you know, because there's so much we don't even know. I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask you what happens, uh, after the pickle? Well, after the pickle, we kind of, so visualize a, a keyhole. The pickle is kind of round. We make the pickle round and the bird, and that's starting to come up to heat. That's typically running, you know, 95, hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And, um, when, and, and the birds are on it and they're, they're carving little, they're carving their little passageways in it. And they're, well, they, they excavate out these little terraces and hang, you know, caves almost. It's, um, so after the pickle, we, we kind of break it out into a thermophilic windrow and the temperature comes up. And now we go from being round to being, you know, shaped and, and long and narrow. And the temperature comes up and, you know, we get to the, we go into a phase we call tracking, which is where we achieve the NOP minimum threshold of 131. Okay. And, but we also, our own turn action is we're trying not to overheat. So our turn action comes at about 140 Fahrenheit, hundred, you know, we like to leave things undisturbed for several day residencies. You know, we like seven. The rule says that it'll exceed one, three, one for 15 days during which time it needs to be turned five times. Um, we call a turn a complete inversion. So sometimes we'll turn two times in a day and, and achieve, uh, and, and, you know, we end up getting, uh, uh, we go long beyond tracking at relevant process to further reduce pathogen temperatures. Um, but, uh, so we, <clears throat> but we like to get time for actinomycetal fiber networks to form. Um, and we don't like to exceed our t- target kind to the beneficials temperatures. And, uh, and then we start turning down the line. We don't use any, we just use loaders and, um, typically loaders or, uh, hydraulic excavator, typically with the bucket turned other way too. We, we just pile and repile. We don't, you're not running through here with one of these fancy compost turners. A slash and burn turn machine. No, no, we, we don't, we're not looking, we, we're, we're trying to retain porosity and and the and 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 hyphal forming um, spaces because a lot of the the benefits come from network forming in the process. Uh, so those extremely aggressive machines, if they have a place, and and some of the machines, some of the German machines have gotten a lot better at being much less aggressive. So like CompTech and uh, Top CompTech and Oh, some of the, uh, the, the German machines are, are, um, and the Finnish machines, the Europeans are uh, using augers. You can flight them differently, but even flighted augers, you know, there's a compaction and pressing thing. At the end of the day, our attitude is you got to have a loader kind of anywhere. We haven't figured out how to do without it. Loaders are kind of industrial standard currency. So they're fully evolved and competition has, you know, made them better on a price per pound basis than dedicated machinery and certainly a lot more liquid in terms of buy and sell. We're a boutique, as I say. So if I can send, I, you know, we have a, a, I mean, a man, a good man on the right side can turn 5,000 yards of compost in a day um, with a loader. And um, that, that keeps the cost uh, reasonable on a per turn basis. And, you know, especially and here, this comes back to the whole idea about systems and embodied costs and, and then ultimately the impact on unit cost. You know, if, if you're if you have as a standard that you want the whole facility to be returnable to agriculture, if the need for the facility diminishes, diminishes, changes or disappears, uh, then, uh, you know, I mean, yeah. So, the, again, loader gives you the flexibility. You can actually build the site with the loader if you know what you're doing. Like 
So uh, we like to keep it low tech. And remember, a, a machine cannot make compost. Microbes make compost. So every machine, everything you do, every evolution either serves your goals in compost making or hinders them. And the same machine can do both in different contexts or at different phases. If you, if you, if you diminish the porosity too much, you can't include enough oxygen. Uh, to, you'd, you'd be running, you'd be turning it constantly. And there are systems with these slashing, slashing machines that do call for daily turning and you're still not maintaining oxygen levels. So really it's a strategy thing. I mean, you know, ideally you build it once and it does everything you want right there with no turns, well, you've still got a surface that didn't get treatment, okay? So you right. need a certain number of inversions, three at the minimum, okay? In effect, we, because our process also moves the material literally down the hill towards a, a goal, a place where we make it into, well, put it on trucks and turn it, you know, make it into money. So, uh, so when you say literally, you're starting at the top of the hill with the with the pickle and it's gradually rolling down. Well, we have a lot. Yeah, we, everything is rolling, is going down the hill to the to the road, <laughs> as it were. We try to start at the top because we'd rather throw down than throw up. You know, throwing up is expensive. Occasionally you got to throw up, but you don't like to make a habit of it. That's <laughs> that's called bulimic, right? You know, if you're throwing up all the time. So, uh, uh, again, you know, this is uh, at, at what we do is a material handling task, but the handling, each step of turning, each movement, everything has biological impact and you want it working for you and for the beneficials and not against you. Compost is coming down the hill in the windrows, yep. getting turned with the with the big loader. And not too big, by the way. We limit, we, we run uh, what's typically called a two and a half or three yard machine. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a 25,000 pound machine. Uh, we run a particular bucket that you can see into a um, it's a Volvo built it. It's it's they call it a grading and landscaping bucket, and it's a very long floor. Doesn't have a lot of breakout. It's fairly low, um, and it enables you to really see the cutting edge, so that you can, because uh, we want to be very intimate with the material. Because I'll sometimes say to an operator, you know, D have you been everywhere in this pile? Do you know it? And it, you get into the meditation of rolling, and we have a very organized set of strategies for. Uh, you know, you try to imagine lifting the A horizon off and throwing it over on the other side of the pile and combining it with the A horizon on the other. You, you arbitrarily break the pile up into the A horizon, which is its surface, and the B horizon, which is its core. And you, you decide as an operator what the depth of the A horizon is. Let's say it's, you know, for practical purposes, it would be a foot or 18 inches that you're going to skive off and throw over onto the other side. Um, and now of course it's over there with the other a horizon, right? Now your next pass and you go the length of the thing and you, you take off that manageable amount and you throw it over the pile and there's a little ad mixing. We're not worried about that here. Your next, the, the second pass at the pile, you're into the B horizon, right? And now your right. goal is to bury the combined a horizon that you just assembled on the other side of that pile with B horizon. And typically it'll take three with the windrows we manage, it'll take three passes. Yeah. By the way, any windrow turning machine has an optimum windrow size. Loaders, the optimum windrow size is quite a bit broader. And one of the reasons I say we don't want too big a loader is we don't want to encourage operators to have the capacity to make piles that are too big. Or, you know, again, we're trying typically not to drive on the material, though there are exceptions to that rule. Carl, we're going to take a break here to get a word from our sponsors. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by the Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. What if you didn't have to worry about weak transplants and poor germination due to less than great potting soil or getting truly finished compost for your homemade blend or making sure that your employees remember to add the fertilizer charge? Ugh been there, done that. What if you could chuck grow plants up until the roots filled the container without having to worry about supplying extra fertility? What if your potting soil had your back consistently year after year? That's what Vermont Compost Potting Soil can bring to you. Vermont Compost Fall Pre-Buy Program going on now through December 21st can ensure that you enjoy the guaranteed best price, the best shipping options, and receive your soil at a time that works best for you. Plus, their shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that get shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. 
taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Audible, where you can get a free audiobook download when you sign up for a free 30-day trial at audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer. I've been a fan of the spoken word since I read along with children's stories on a portable 78 RPM record player. I love the way that engaging in the oral tradition works with a different part of my brain than reading does and the presence that it brings to ideas and voices. And it's so easy to tap into spoken word audio now that you probably carry an iDevice or an Android with you just about everywhere you go. Audible has over 100,000 titles that you can choose from, ranging from great science fiction and romance to self-help and business titles. I want to recommend one book that will resonate with any who has run a business or a farm, The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. Gerber lays out the fundamental challenge of making the leap from being great at doing the work to becoming great at running a business and provides practical suggestions for fostering that change. Just go to audibletrial.com slash farmer to farmer to get your free download of The E-Myth Revisited or any other book from Audible's extensive library. And we're back with Carl Hammer from the Vermont Compost Company. You know, Carl, something that's really interesting to me about Vermont Compost as a company is that it feels like the complexity and the commitment to expressing it is a real core of Vermont Compost Company's way of doing business and, well, and just of the business that you're in. If you want to depend on a technology, I like stable half billion year old ones. I mean, if you're going to imitate a technology without a full deck of cards about its what's under the hood, which is what we farmers do, right? <laughs> Right. We live in this life and, 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 and our own definitions of divinity require that we never know all of it. Right. So, um, uh, uh, the mass of our knowledge is dwarfed by the mass of our ignorance. And that's where, you know, awe and respect, uh, and, and tradition might even come in and, and, and all the old factory and intuitional things that, but, but, you know, to translate that into something you can ship to Iowa and it mostly, on. Uh, comes out of the box working um, again is a is a is is a, a shameless attempt to imitate natural systems with a little twist and we ruminate on on things like terroir what does it mean when this you know germination is an extraordinary moment when a seed germinates it casts um, uh, an enzymic perfume out about itself which wakes the sleeping partners. Right. So when, when I send you potting soil, I'm promising you sleeping partners that will wake right. to your seeds enzymic perfume when it germinates. And 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 out there in Iowa, here's this little slug of Vermont assembled. But we also have brought, you know, coconut coir from the Dominican Republic. We've brought sphagnum from from Quebec. We've brought um, there. There's avocado pits. There's mussels from the, the coast. There's uh, there's there's all of the you know, and, and, and really terra firma isn't there. There is but one soil and it's in active motion in all its phases because soil, the land you stand on it, is only about half solids. And then it's the other half is composed of a constantly adjusting ratio of liquid and gas. And, um, and all of this, you know, has been swirling in the cosmos as dust and ended up here because of various gravitational events that are older even than the technology of plant and soil. Um, and, and here we stand in this specific moment. So what does it mean when across 500 different plastic covered venues on April 1st, all these eyes are on this inch deep layer that's probably 60 acres spread out. Um, and we're all kind of standing in the same field <laughs> doing, you know, it has a, a tremendous, um, management utility in that we can talk to each other. And, you know, so if whoever's having trouble actually can get feedback through me, as it were, from other people literally using the same batch of this thing. And we can often do extraordinary forensics on a specific greenhouse situation because we can call the other people in the batch and see what's happening with them. And then we tap into their vast experience in petunia growing or whatever. Um, that's where we came up with that slogan that may or may not be kind of communicate what, why grow alone. But, you know, and, and is this unprecedented in human history, this level of casting 
uh, and you know, we don't make soil. We, we participate in the mystery. We assemble things and, and, uh, because it would be much too, yeah, well, we don't, we don't really make much of anything. If, if by that you mean that we that we conjure it from, completely from air, um, although you know plants conjure substance from air. That's what trees are. That's what grass is. That's where the carbon comes from. But and we're we're only um, so and and we're not separate from soil. We are walking soil, and and that is not a metaphor. That is a pretty concise uh, biophysical description of the of the thermodynamic reality. We inhabit. Um, we, um, so, but we're tiny, we talking, we humans are such a tiny portion of the overall biomass that, you know, in, on the crust here, uh, you know, insects outweigh all the rest of animal biomass, fungus and bacteria each way outweigh animal biomass. I sometimes wonder, you know, what as walking soil and now I'm talking soil and thinking soil and now I'm a I'm 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 doing commerce in soil. OK, what is my particular <laughs> responsibility as this in, tiny portion of the soil biomass to the rest of the community? Um, that's not a question I was going to answer. It was just one I was going to throw. Oh, rats. <laughs> no, you know. Boy, Carl, you could have, you could have, you could have, that could have been a winner. Uh, well, oh. I, I will say a few things I do know. Um, you know, truthfulness is important in the process. Um, you know, okay. So you, let's say bark is important to you. You think bark is really important. So, and the guy who's selling you bark likes selling you bark because he's doing better than burning it, which is where we compete directly. You know, you, you know, he has a choice with a debarking machine, a rouser head. He wants to go down in a little more. The slabs aren't worth anything. He'll add them into the bark. And we see this in, in the mulch industry all the time. You know, somebody's making beautiful hemlock bark and it sells like crazy. And oh shit, you know, it'd be nice to have more of that. We'll just hog into the log a little deeper every time till now we're adding quite a lot of wood. It's not bark anymore, but we're selling it as bark. So over time, a bark supply could turn into a wood supply. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a different thing. Um, and, I, you know, so you you as the composter need to be aware that that's happening to you. Um, uh, uh, telling yourself the truth about materials. And one of the reasons, uh, you know, a lot of times people tour our facility and say, oh, my God, I'd love to do all of that. But that stuff is it's just too expensive. And, you know, well. OK, but the question is, what do you mean? We <laughs> there's nothing more expensive than potting soil. It doesn't really work. And the potting soil is based on the quality of its ingredients. OK. And, you know, there we can make very foul things fair in compost. But uh, and while it is magic, it's it, it still matters. You know, you can only improve poor ingredients so much by their cooking. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, and, and so we come at composting from a soil perspective, first and foremost. And so there are many, many things we're not interested in composting, you know, all the way from egregious examples, like we don't do petroleum remediation. Okay. That's a very lucrative part of the compost industry. You don't hear a lot about it because, you know, but cow shit is one of the best actors to, you know, because every gas station that gets its single wall tanks out needs a remediation event. And the best way to do it is to mix that polluted soil with cow manure and keep turning it with auger turners, typically like a brown bear. Uh, and you know, till you've, uh, till you've consumed those hydrocarbons. Um, so Carl, you know, I'm feeling like talking to you and, and this is, this has always happened. And I think in every conversation I've had with you always makes me realize just how much I don't know. I mean, even about stuff that I thought that I knew about, I mean, you were talking about, um, you know, things going on in the rhizosphere. You're talking about things, uh, you know, differences in, in different parts of the plant when you're talking about carbon nitrogen ratios. I mean, all of that, you're obviously somebody who's digging into stuff all the time, but where would you turn me or, or, uh, your, your average market farmer to, to dig a little bit deeper into the plant and the soil biology? Well, we have a, a bibliography, which is regrettably also a work in progress and not complete, but it has some books that are available. If, if books are your thing, um, um, you know, I read a lot of the basic stuff, the agricultural test testaments or Albert Howard, we shamelessly took feed the soil as a corporate logo. Uh, you know, it's Albert Howard who said, uh, feed the soil and the soil will feed the plant. 
And another principle that Albert Howard brought you know, it, to the extent that he was a great T-shirt artist of phrasing, uh, you know, he said, nature does not farm without animals. Uh, so, you know, we find ourselves, as I've sometimes thought of it, as the thin brown line that connects specialized husbandry to specialized horticulture, uh, you know, like a streak of shit, Captain Compost. <laughs> but, you know, if you... Uh, so, OK, back to books. Uh, the Microbiology, a great help to me, was a book that Elliot Coleman turned me on to in the 70s or early 80s, I guess. By a, It was published. It was 60 Soviet biologists doing a study. The lead investigator was a man named Krasilnikov. It's called... Uh, Soil Microbes in Higher Plants. It was published in 61. It's a uh, link to it is on our website. It's all online. Soviet scientists became aware. Remember, Russia, Russia, most of our soil science vocabulary originated in with Russian. The Russians were the modern pioneers in soil science in the 18th and then 19th centuries. On um, So words like podzol, many of our, our soil morphology definitions were originally Russian. Um, um, you know, uh, they, they described alluviated soils, aeolian soils, wind deposited soils. This is all Russian work. They had remembered the, the huge empire with many different soils. Um, so uh, somewhere in the fifth, or late, you know, early fifties, uh, these Soviet science microbiologists got very interested. They became aware that if you take um, if you leave out evapotranspiration of water, if you leave out the water transfer, because plants pump a lot of water, plants are solar pumps. They pump a lot of water out of the soil into the atmosphere. But if you leave out that weight mass balance, and if you take only what they take from soil for minerals and what they put back into soil, it's very comparable weight. The mass of what plants remove from soil is very comparable to what they exude into soil. And these scientists, you know, there's been so much emphasis, uh, you know, von Liebig, von Liebig and European soil science, which the Russians were building on, the chemical science all came from Germany and so on. And by the way, it's, in fairness to Eustace von Liebig, he recanted of the NPK theory before he died. By then, nobody was interested. There was a fertilizer industry. But he kept amending NPK until he hit the limits on other nutrients. And that's how we discovered all the smaller elements. And, but at the end of it, he had done it enough to where he published and said, uh, humus, we deplete the humus when we put chemicals in soil, and this can't be sustained. And by then, he was an old man, and there was a fertilizer industry, and nobody paid any attention. And it's very unfair. He's now the father of chemical agriculture. And he was a good scientist who pursued his work to the conclusion that we all now sadly face. Um, but um, so the Russians, these scientists in the 50s, said, why are these plants doing this? What, what, why does this pay? What you know? What's the economics of this for plants? And they studied all of the things about, they started looking at these exudates that actually, and these microbial partners that break down complex carbon structures, lignin, lig, lignum, cellulose, hemicellulose, and they did it in glass boxes so they could watch it done. And they published this extremely wonderful book of photographs. They named all the actors, all the important ones, actinomycetes, azotobacters, micro, they, it, it's, it, it, it gave me well, I'm still eating, dining out on that book, which I haven't reread in years and probably should. Well, and we'll, we'll make sure that we've got a link to that on the, uh, on the show yeah, notes you know, page. The others are like uh, books like Farmers of 40 Centuries. Remember that F.H. King, well, he wrote the book Soil. He was, uh, as in, you know, he was up there in the late 19th century, like Liberty Hyde Bailey in Madison and, and, and I mean, at Cornell and, 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 and King. Um, and, and he wrote, some great books that were basic texts, the physics of agriculture, still something people should read. You know, it was F.H. King that first made clear to me that, well, that butter, that any fat is synthesized from air. There are no minerals in, in, in butter. I mean, except occasionals, because all of the components of a fat, those hydrocarbons are in the air. Um, and so if you ship a fat, if you ship butter, like, you know, when you ship wool, you're shipping the rocks, the basic silica. Wool is very high in, in, in mineral componentry. But it, right. it, and so if you ship the wool, you're shipping the farm. If you ship fat, you're, you're enriching the farm. So, you know, a beer and butter farm <laughs> where, you know, beer is butter, <laughs> okay. And, 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 and if you let everything else stay on the farm, 
Uh, and that's why that's what remineralized Vermont after the catastrophic sheep boom, because Vermont had two waves of soil damage. First came the burners who who burn who charcoal made charcoal for the forges of New England and lye for its soap making. So the burners were not much respected people. They were the first wave of Europeans and they were what they sounded like. They dug pits and filled them with wood and burned it so they could sell charcoal and ash. And they were dirty and they were hard bitten. And they were followed by farmers who, you know, the sheep boomers, the introduction of the marine merino sheep. And in the wake of the burners, there was all this cleared land. So they they went ahead and, you know, that that came to a halt with the invention of the cotton gin. And by then, Vermont had been 85 percent cleared and overgrazed on sheep. And all of the beautiful little red brick houses from the 1820s and 30s in Vermont are sheep boom houses. OK. Um, and people got rich. And then it ended um, with the invention of the cotton gin because the English mills transitioned from wool to that much cheaper fiber, which was not a cheaper fiber until there was a mechanical gin. Right. Um, and and the sheep boom ended and the forest came and Vermont and, and the Civil War came and and people discovered Ohio and, and Western New York and and Wisconsin and things. And a lot of people never came back because Vermont didn't really have a soil resource comparable in any way. And then the Erie Canal opened a little before that and grain started, you know, as all this is going on, grain started coming across it as the sheep boom ended in the in the 30s and 40s. Grain started trickling across the canal and displaced all Vermont grain growing. Vermont had been New England's breadbasket, but all of that buffalo shit made corn and wheat, buffalo shit grass stuff flowing across the Erie Canal. And at, at the same time, railroad connection to Boston occurred. And so it became incredibly plausible and profitable to feed a little grain, make butter in Vermont's beautiful alpine climate and ship it on trains to Boston. And so that remineralized Vermont with Jersey cows down a little further in the watershed, fed the buffalo shit crossing the Erie Canal and shipped as 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 air made butter to Boston. That's the Vermont I showed up in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, that's just so, I mean, you, when you really think about that, it's pretty, I mean, that's a pretty amazing chain of causality that you just, I don't think that we're, we're very in touch with. Well, look at the, I, look I, at the I, miracle of Henry Ford, look at Chicago or, or McCormick or Colt or any of them. That's all soil that fed those workers that enabled, you know, people think Henry Ford invented uh, selling the car to the worker. But all of that was based on buffalo shit being made manifest as inexpensive pork, corn, and wheat in the industrial centers. And so this is all a soil story. And of course, the, the, the Plains Indians knew if you scar it, it blows away because it was all aeolian soil. It blew there in the first place. And that's true in China now. The, 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 the terrible mistake is being repeated. The Yellow River is yellow because all that's thousands of feet of, of, of windblown loess that form the, the big central agricultural capabilities of China. And so we repeat that mistake again and again in the last 10,000 years. And of course, all of this can be glued back together by sucking down the CO2. If Americans would consent to have three inch lawns, because when you go shorter than that, you interrupt the, 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 the sequestration because the, you know, grasses store their reserves in their stubble, not in their roots. You can mow legumes shorter. And a lot of our cropping is about getting the whole crop off the field. And you, it'd be a lot better if we could figure out how to crop our grasses longer. We could actually get to higher total production. And that's why mob grazing can be so effective if you if you leave the grass, you know, at the three in, at that three inch level where you don't interrupt right. the the high, sp high speed sequestration, sugar squirting events, you know. So, I mean, we're actually reviewing our own mowing machines and trying to figure out how we can harvest higher, take less at each slice. And it's, you know, from a haymaker's point of view, it's a challenge because you want that ground something you can dry between your windrows and long grass is a problem for that. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, but it's all a soil story. And that of course is not really taught in the history books. Not really. 
uh, all many, you know, much, and, and, and a soil story always is a water story because it, it's, it is, but one soil, the whole crust. And, you know, Vernatsky, are you familiar with Vernatsky, a Russian I'm cosmologist? Not. Well, who, he's a geologist who pointed out at a certain point that the entire surface biology of this planet, as we know it, is the geology is constantly and totally dominated by biology. And it's not as slow. When we talk about geologic time, when it gets to the surface, that accelerates because of biology. And we are a manifestation of that acceleration for good and ill. <laughs> you know, when we do certain things, wow, there's a lot of geology happens in a hurry. And, you know, Vermont right. compost is a, ge a, a, a geological force. We hope for for good. And, you know, I hope that when we get before the celestial soil board and the clerk opens his, his book and he says, wow, man, you moved a lot of soil. And I say, well, you know, you have to understand the cultural context. It was mitigating. We, uh, you know, these are our reasons for having taken responsibilities. We moved it in the right direction. We, yeah, we tried. I mean, you know, if try and, and I'm not sure trying is, you know, I mean, that can be an excuse for many ills. So at a certain point, it's for others to judge, you know, but we like to hope that we're going to leave a little sort of thing that, you know, is, uh, you know, one of those intensely feckin' places in a balanced way. Um, Carl, at the end, at the end of every show, we like to do a lightning round. So I got a couple of quick questions for you. First one is what's your favorite tool on the farm? I've had so many tools that were favorites at any given moment from my first knife. Now my big tool, the one I probably use the most is my mind and my mouth. <laughs> and so, you know, I guess I'm going to reach it out there. I'm going to say my favorite tool is good communication when it, when that happens. Our farm is now a social organism and I do get a, it, it. Well, I'm trying to discourage myself from trying to clean up and not tell anybody what that I got on a loader this weekend and nobody had capped and it was getting a little smelly. Uh, and I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't even be the one to notice it. A lot of my job now is to notice when we're approaching the, the guardrails and communicate that in a timely fashion to the appropriate people and encourage them to see it for themselves. So I guess that, you know, and my, my mind and my mouth are both imperfect tools <laughs> and my mouth, especially. Uh, <laughs> and so as, as my, as in, Approaching decrepitude of my body comes along and I'm not the, I, I hope kindness, my kindness has improved. So kindness would be, you know, an aspirational tool. I was just going to ask you what farmer superpower you would choose. Empathy. And not only for people, people are very, you know, and I, I have to say, you know, we all come to these entrepreneurial managements with whatever our strengths and wow, weaknesses are. And, you know, compost always exposed itself to me deeply and constantly. And people are the eternal mystery to me. And, and so it has been, you know, and teaching may or may not be my forte. There's a lot there, but can I get it to people? I think that empathy thing, that's so apparent in everything you talk about. I mean, when you talk about, I mean, that seems like something that's a real core characteristic like that. So Carl, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing way back there in 1984, what would it be? Well, while it is possible to amend soil to make it productive, it's a lot more effective to start with great soil and great soil tells, you know, farmers on great soils hire professionals to build the beautiful barns and farmers on mountain soil have to build their own barn. Uh, so I have always been, you know, in that sense, but there's a, there's a, there's a truth beyond that truth. Urban is, you know, where the people are, you can amend the matrix at the huge cost. And if you're near the eaters, you can make that work too. You follow me? So yep. if you, you really better have great soil if you're out in the willy wax. Um, if you're in town, now you can excuse laying it up six feet deep just because, you know, over time. And so both, both that sounded contradictory perhaps. But, you know, if I had been born to or landed somehow on 800 acres of Hadley silt, I doubt I would have become a, a potting soil maker in the way that I have. 
there just wouldn't have been the need. I wouldn't have ended up knowing. Yeah. I wouldn't have been seen the need. I wouldn't have, you know, I would have moved in directions that utilize perfect soil if that's what you're dealt. So Carl, I really thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been, um, eye opening. I, I really feel like I've learned a lot about plants and, and biology and, and, and things going on under the soil. Really, really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 35 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for hammer. That's H-A-M-M-E-R. If you enjoy the podcast, I think you would also enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for watering transplants. You can sign up at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. These reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. You know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. I know a lot of things, but I know I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear or let me know on Facebook at Purple Pitchfork. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.